Hi everyone, thanks for having me. I would like to start by really giving a, a good gesture for the organizers here. Uh, they've brought us uh, here from around the world and, and they've organized a really cool event which you're part of. I can see that everyone is, uh, I hope everyone is having fun. As the speakers, we're certainly, certainly having fun and they're taking care of you and it's all volunteering. So let's give them a good round of applause so that they know you appreciate it. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, Async Away, the promised land, or the way I like to visualize it. Hang on, it's clicker thing issues. Async Away and the promised land. Okay, I, a few words about me. My name is Amit Sur. I'm a development developer at Apple Tools, where we develop. Um, uh, visual uh, application visual management tools, namely visual regression tests. So uh, that's the perfect black box. I've joined them. Um, I've joined Apple Tools a few months back, and I've been having a lot of fun working with amazing guys, amazing folks. Sorry, um, and it's been really fun. Um, I'm also a tech speaker for Mozilla, and occasionally I do contribute code to Firefox Dev, Dev Tools. And I'm also an organizer of certain, several events in Israel, including uh, the Goodness Squad, which is, um, which is a monthly hacking event where people come and spend an evening contributing code to uh, open source projects. So it's a really cool format that we've come up with. So if you're interested in organizing these sorts of things, do let me know. Um, and you can catch me on Twitter, on Medium, on GitHub. Um, I'm here for the rest of our conference, so if you have any questions, feel free to uh, approach. So we are going to talk about async await, and I don't want to approach it from the traditional way that we normally explain what async await is. So let's first, uh, with a raise of hand, who here knows what I'm talking about when I say async await? Okay, about 50%, good. So. Traditionally, we explain this through the same cognitive, cognitive path that we went through, which is first we had callbacks. I'm talking about JavaScript, of course. Uh, then we had promises. A few of us have actually used generators, and then we reached async await, and that's how we perceive it. In this, in, in this talk, I would like to go the other way around, right? Because we're almost in 2019, and we can have a modern uh, way of thinking. So I. So async await is a concept that is built upon and relies on promises. And I do want to explain promises, but I want to explain them through async await concepts and not the other way around. So if we have time also, I'll touch uh, a little bit on callbacks. <clears throat> so let's start. We have a simple, simple program. Uh, what it does is it fetches data from a really nice API that's called fixer.io. Uh, it's an API that gives you currency rates. So you specify a certain date in history and a base currency and a list of, uh, of other currencies that you want to get the rate for. Um, so I'm fetching that data. I get a response. Uh, if it's not OK, I throw an error. Um, then I parse the body of the, of the response, and at the end, I, I log the, <clears throat> the actual rate of the currency. So here I'm taking the Polish Lottie uh, against, the, against Euro. So it's all very nice. Let's start, start by analyzing. There are a few things here, await, async. Um, so let's start by analyzing what's going on. So what is this function fetch? What is, what is the return? Anybody? OK, so it's returning a promise. It's returning a promise, which is a construct that's saying, I don't have this value right now, but here have this instance of an object that, will hold, that holds a way to get the value that's going to be in the future. So at the point where I make the request, I naturally don't have the value of the currency rate. However, in the future, when the requ request completes, I will be able to query that promise and get that value. Now. What exactly is a promise? So a promise starts is uh, an object that has several states. It starts by being unresolved. By the way, who here knows why this appears as unresolved? Do you know what it is? 
yeah, I, 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 I knew you'd come, you know. <laughs> I knew someone would say, yeah, it's for Maslow's last theorem, uh, and it's actually resolved, you're right. But it was unresolved for a long time. Um, so it starts as being in a state of unresolved. And then it has two paths. One path is uh, it's going to be resolved, and it's going to be resolved with a certain value. And the other path that it can take is something bad happened during that asynchronous uh, uh, action, and it was rejected. And I chose the image that best describes how a programmer feels when they didn't do proper error handling in their code. So, so this is a promise. Now, um, how do I get the actual value of a promise? How do I... How do you open this box and get the value? Anybody? Then. Okay. Okay. So not then. No. I await it. I await the promise and I get the value. That's the way I get the value of the promise. What happens with the rejections? How do I get the error of the rejection? Now from the previous, uh, from this one you should not say dot .catch. I try catch. So it's very natural. So the construct of async await shows us how we take the asynchronous control flow and integrate it into the language, as opposed to promises where it's an API. It's, uh, the, the IDE will not highlight it as a keyword. So await is a keyword, and try catch is a, is a language construct. And if I want to get the rejection from that promise, I just try catch. Okay, so let's go, let's go back, let's explain this. Um, so what I do here is I start by going out and fetching. This transmits an HTTP request to get the data. And then, and now I, I await it to get the actual value from the promise. That actual value is the response with its headers and its status code. So if it's like 200, it's gonna, it's gonna response.okay will be, will be good. And we continue. If it's not, if it's 500, for instance, response OK will be, will be false. And I will throw an error. And then I await the actual body to, to come in. And then I get the, uh, the response rates. So all this it has uh, two asynchronous fl flows, but looks just like synchronous code, which is really uh, makes it understandable. Writing the same thing with promises and dot then dot catch would be much less readable. OK. Oh, one more thing is in order to use await, I need to define the function that the, the await statement is in as an async function. So that's just a way for the language to say, um, you know, this is declaratively, explicitly an asynchronous function. And we'll, we'll under, also understand what uh, using the async uh, keyword means. So let's talk about async functions. So we've seen one, we've seen fetch, which is a function that re returns a promise. And async functions are just functions that, that return a promise. Um, so how do I write one? I use the async keyword. So this function, fetch euro rate, gets two arguments, a date and a symbol. And just fetches the data uh, of the currency rate against the euro at a certain date. So, um, and does just the same thing for error throws and then parses the body and returns the actual rate. Now, what exactly does this function return? Let's look at it. Does anybody have any idea? A promise. However, it doesn't, it doesn't look like that from the code, right? It looks like it's returning the actual rate, the actual value. Async functions have a characteristic that they always return a promise. So it's returning promise because it was defined as async. So if it returns a promise, how do I resolve it? How does the function actually say when that promise is resolved and what the, what, what the value is. So the way to do it is to return the value. So by returning from the function, 
I'm actually resolving the promise with that return value. And if I want to reject that promise, I just throw an error. And that makes the, the promise rejected with the error that I threw. Now, um, what happens if I don't return? Anybody? So if I don't return from the function, uh, just like normal JavaScript, the return value, the, the function returns undefined, which means that the async function returns a promise that resolves to undefined, that the value, that promise is resolved with the value of undefined. So it's all very natural. Now, how do I actually call an async function? I need to await it. And in order to await it, my function also needs to be async. So I start with an async function. In order to await it, I also need to be inside an async function. And the one that's calling that again. And you can understand how this goes. So I really need all of my call stack to be defined as async functions. So this is just like the, the theory, right? Turtles all the way down. And there's a famous story that appears in the opening of uh, Stephen Hawking's uh, uh, Brief History of Time, where he's, he's telling the story about um, a famous astronomer uh, doing a public presentation and explaining uh, uh, about how uh, the universe works and how the uh, Earth orbits the sun and everything. And then at the end of the lecture, uh, uh, an old lady rises up uh, and says, you know, everything you just said is rubbish. Everyone knows that the Earth is sitting on top of a giant tortoise. And the famous astronomer looks at her and uh, has a, a small smirk and says, and what does this giant tortoise uh, stand on? And she's like, you're very clever, but everyone knows it's turtles all the way down. So, in a way, that's also what happens here. It's async all the way up. So what happens at the beginning? What happens at the beginning of time, at the beginning of our program? We just call it. So our first function is main, and we just call it. And the return value for main is uh, ignored, so it really doesn't matter for us. However, therein lies a problem. Because what happens if this promise rejects? So in my top level, um, so what would happen is I get an unhandled promise rejection. And this is what, how Node handles it. And it's also warning us that, um, that in the future, one of the versions of Node, they will be also exiting the process. So right now, you'll get these warnings in, in your console, but at a certain uh, uh, stage, Node will actually end the process, and your server, if it's a server, will crash. So you really want to handle those promises, and, um, and so top-level functions should catch all exceptions. Now, let's talk about impatience. So with promises, and with async await, impatience is not a virtue. What happens if we remove the await? So response equals the result of fetch. Response would be a promise, right? Because we didn't await the fetch, so response is the return value of fetch. It's a promise. And then we get to throw an error. And this happens between five times a day to 10 times a week for everyone that's using async await. And there's not a lot of mechanism that, uh, that help me uh, as a developer to avoid this. So just remember this if you're using async await. Now let's talk about concurrency, right? Because it's important in the asynchronous control flow. So first of all, 
if I want to do things sequentially, so for instance, I want to get the police lottery rate and the, and the dollar rate, I can do this sequentially. And the way most people will describe, or not most people, but some people will describe this, uh, this, way, this control flow is like this. But it's wrong. It doesn't mean that there is a fetch of Polis Lodi, and then there is a fetch of US dollar, and then there is a console log. Or I should say, just not accurate. The way to visualize it is more like this. I call fetch your rate with Polish Lottie, which creates a, an asynchronous job somewhere, like a thread, a new thread, even though it's not a new thread. And then I await it. So if I didn't await it, I would just continue, but I do await it. And once it's resolved, I continue to the second call, and then I await that as well. So this is a bit... Uh, uh, non-optimized. What if we change this a little bit to this? So I want to call fetch for the polished lotty and not wait for it. Immediately also call fetch your rate for the US dollar and then just await them both, right? How, how this looks in code is this. I don't await the first call and I also don't await the second call and I make sure I name the variable with a promise so that it's clear that I'm holding an instance of a promise. And then I await the first one, and I await the second one. And the sharp-eyed of you who noticed that if the US dollar rate would, uh, uh, comes back really fast and the Polish Lottie uh, comes back really slow, I would have to wait a long time until I await the US dollar. But that doesn't matter, because I want to get them both and then do some work. So it doesn't matter for me what comes before what. So this is a perfectly good example of using uh, concurrency with a wait. And not awaiting these promises is just, if, if you're good with like the thread model, it's like creating separate threads in synchronous languages. So if you were in Java, this would be creating a thread that goes out and waiting. Now let's talk about promise all. Promise.all is, is a way to get concurrency. So just before talking about promise.all, say I want to get like a series of all the currency rates from the beginning of October. Um, I iterate, this is a, doesn't look like a good example. I iterate one through nine and, uh, and create these promises and aggregate them in an array. So I have now an array of promises and then I iterate through these promises and await each one. So just like the, the first example, I await the, them sequentially, but I was actually tr uh, uh, sending out nine HTTP requests at the same time. And at the end, I found a really nice uh, uh, library by Cindrosaurus. By the way, he's do doing amazing stuff with ASCII um, that I give an array of values to, and I get like a nice ASCII graph. So that's what I do. And this is how it's visualized. This is how, what's going on. At a certain point in time, I send out nine requests, and then I continue with the control flow, but I await each of them, each of the nine. And once these nine requests uh, resolve, I, I continue to output to the console, console. Now let's talk about promise all. So promise dot all is a syntax uh, about promises that lets me do this a little, a little bit better. So what it does is I still aggregate these promises and I send them out. But now that I have this array of promises, if I have an array of promises, I instantly know that I need to, uh, to call promise.all to await all of them. So promise.all re receives an array of promises and returns the promise that resolves when all of these uh, promises have resolved. If one of these promises rejects, the whole promise all rejects. 
So the return value from promise all is the array of resolved values from this array of, of promises. And that's how I get the rates, and I do the same thing. And it's visualized a little bit differently. I create an array of promises. I aggregate all of these into the same one single promise, and I await that one single promise. And if I want to be really good, I do a bit of functional style. So I have a range of 1 to 9. I map those values to promises, and then I await uh, using promise.all. And this, this pattern is something that's very prominent and very, uh, very usable in, in coding out asynchronous flows. So a lot of times I have a lot of things I want to do at the same time and then wait on all of them. And mapping, so I have just an array of values for, in this case, uh, one to nine, just numbers, and I map those to promises then, and then I await with promise all. And if I want to be really cool, and this is, this is not just one to be cool, I think, this is, I think this is readable in a way that it describes what the developer, what the programmer wanted to do. So this is ju not just being cool, it's being explicit and not uh, overloading with implementation details because the, the, the previous example was talking a lot about, uh, was, was having a lot of for loops. I couldn't understand what the programmer wanted to do. Here, I can read it from the end to the beginning. I can say, uh, okay, so I'm fetching the euro rate uh, using i. What is i? It's a number between one and 10, not including. Then I wait on all of these and then draw the graph with sparkly. And I can, I can use this uh, where I want. I can use this even for two values. Um, but also here, the map is a good pattern. I can uh, explain myself better using the map and then await promise all. Now, you can see that we're talking about a lot about promises, right? They're the coin that we're passing around all the time. And what happened was that Node initially did not have uh, the, the concept of promise baked in. So only recently did, uh, did a promise become a very central idea to the, to the language. So Node today has a utility that's called Promisify. And what this does is it's taking all the built-in APIs that Node has that work with callbacks and transforming those to APIs that work with, work with promises. So if I want to read the date uh, that I want to fetch the currency rate for from a file, I want to read the file. Reading a file is I.O. It's asynchronous. So asynchronous means promises. Asynchronous means I want to await. I just want to read the file, await for, the, uh, for, for reading the file, and then continue. So in order to read the file and to await a read file, read file needs to return a promise. So I use uh, util.promisify on the built-in read file uh, uh, function to make it a function that returns a promise. And then continue in my, in my day. Now, I do want to mention promise.then. Because it's important, it's important still, uh, uh, even with wor working with async await, the promise API still is relevant. So let's say I have these, all these dates. So I await read file. But now I want to iterate through the values. I need to process this file. I need to split it on new lines. So what I'm doing here is I'm awaiting read file, but I'm not awaiting on the promise that's returned from read file. What dot then is doing at, at the third row there, third line, is mapping the first promise to a new promise that returns something else. Returns a projection of the value that was resolved in the first promise. So 
the first promise returns a, a, bu a buffer. It returns the value of the, the content of the file. But I want to take that buffer, make it into a string, and split on new lines, and get a, a promise that actually resolves to an array of dates. And again, I map these array, this array of dates onto promises for fetch. So, pr so promises are coined for passing around. Now I have a question for you. Anybody knows what this function would return? A promise, I'm very glad you said. However, there's something confusing here. What would happen if I remove the await? So I want, the whole reason I did this talk was that you would have the building blocks and the basic concept to understand what's going on here. So this is an async function, so by definition it's returning a promise, and it's returning the value that fetch URL resolves to. I could just as well not mark it as an async function and return the value and return just what fetch returns, which would be better. So this is a bad example because there's no reason to await uh, the fetch. It's just wrapping the, fet the promise that's returning from fetch with a new promise. And ESLint actually has a rule that says, uh, that catches these things and warns you that you do not need to await in, on a return statement. The one time I would want to await on a return statement is if I want to catch the error. So if I don't catch the, if I don't use await, I would need to use dot catch or whatever. Okay, in the test world, async await really helps. So let's say I have a function, fetch your, uh, your value, which would throw. This is, this is bad. This doesn't work. So I can't expect this asynchronous function to throw because it doesn't throw. What I can do is await it. And not just await it because if I await something that's going to be rejected, I'm going to get an error. But then I catch. I use promise.catch. And I map that error to some value that I do expect. So in, in a test, a lot of times I expect a failure. I use dot .catch to actually say, I expect to get a failure. If you get an error, you know, map the error to, onto uh, the message inside. And then I can expect that the return value from the catch promise equals error. In Selim web, web driver, I everything is asynchronous, right? And it's it's testing. Nothing is nothing is going on in the same process. I'm going out to the browser. I'm talking with the browser. I'm I'm communicating. It's all asynchronous. So uh, Selim web driver gives me an API that's using all all promises. And before async await, I would have to work with the promise constructs to get a control flow that's slightly unreadable. And now with the wait, everything just looks synchronous, even though it's not. So, so I say, navigate to this URL, and I just wait for it. In the next line, find this element, click on it, and at the finally, I can just close the browser. Now, um, how much time do we have? One minute. So these slides will be, will be online. So you can look at the two bonuses that I have. How do you do timeouts and how do you turn callbacks into promises? But I do want to leave like half a minute uh, for questions if you want. Um, any questions? Is there a way to sort of abstract all the awaits? Because automation is all about synchronous. I don't want to be using await for each and every statement all over the place. Is there a way to sort of abstract that out and say everything is going to be synchronous, unless I tell it to be asynchronous? 
Yeah, so when I started uh, first using async await, uh, my first thought was to propose, uh, to make a proposal to the ECMAScript so that by default everything is await because in today's world everything is asynchronous. Um, I stopped thinking about that idea. However, <laughs> um, there are uh, numerous solutions that don't use await where uh, it's sort of a mixed control flow where you don't use await, so it's all synchronous, but it's adding things to a queue and then executing them after after the whole thing has run. I think it's very confusing. So the answer to your question is no. Uh, you can't avoid it. What you can avoid if you have a lot of promises and they all go out at the same time, you can and you want to await every all of them is use promise.all like I showed, but essentially if you do want to use a lot of uh, asynchronous steps, do this and then do this and then do that, you're going to have to use await. So yeah, it's going to be a very, a very central thing that, uh, in your day-to-day -day job. Thank you very much.